This is episode 124 of the XY podcast with Scott Farmer. If you're part of the XY Facebook group, you'd know we really try and focus on the things within the industry and our businesses we can control and keep discussions as positive and constructive as we can. In saying this, though, we of course understand there's a ton of uncertainty within financial services at the moment. However, even in light of this, Scott Farmer, the founder of Bravium, really believes this is a golden opportunity for advisors to reevaluate their business models, think about how they can add and articulate value to their clients, and continue to evolve. He doesn't for one minute think it will be easy, but he's confident it will be so worth it if advisors are to continue making a meaningful difference to clients' lives and build profitable businesses. This episode is Scott lifting the lid on his business processes and values and showing us what's inside. Scott explains how he made the switch to a fee-for-service model, what he thinks the first step is to letting go of insurance comms, his initial client engagement steps, and why he went out and built his own cash flow fintech solution. Before we kick things off with Scott, and for those who missed it on the digital grapevine, XY on Tour is now live and tickets are available for you to get your hands on. 25 speakers across six locations with hundreds of advisors and one elusive yellow combi. And for the first time ever, we're heading to the Gold Coast, Newcastle and Canberra. Head to the show notes of this episode where you can find the link to grab your tickets now. Hub24 is an ASX listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Well, we're here today with Scott Farmer from Bravium. Is that is that pronouncing it right? I'm not sure. Bravium is how we Bravium. say it anyway. Okay. Well, you guys are from Canberra, so <laughs> you say, <laughs> say things differently. <laughs> so, Scott, like it's been a it's been a big week. It's uh, Royal Commissions come out, mm-hmm. and you're you're like down in Canberra. Do, do you feel like you're closer to the action down there, or not really? No, I don't think uh, I don't think it feels like that. But uh, yeah, huge week though. Yeah, absolutely. So. Bit more clarity, I guess, on on what it all means. Hmm. Do you do you feel that like clarity in terms of I guess what they what they've said and what their intent is from the Royal Commission? Do you feel that can you see the changes that are going to happen? How what's your confidence level on what's going to be executed? Mm. And yeah, that's. It's interesting, I think. Um, I mean, my view's always been that um, you know government wouldn't lead change in our industry. Um, and, and, you know, I think probably the Royal Commission was the best shot that they'll ever have at actually trying to force through some kind of permanent cultural change. Um, but in all honesty, I think um, what will lead the industry to make significant change is probably the clients. Um, mm. And if you look at history, you know, they've probably led most of the changes to date anyway. Um, mm. And I think what will happen um, is we'll have... Uh, uh, successful businesses who are trying new business models and I think more advisors will see those uh, models being successful and and will look to replicate something similar or or have their own ideas but I think the idea of kind of replicating uh, what's happened over the past 20 or 30 years is is dead nobody wants to do what we did 20 years ago totally well Mm. the government doesn't definitely no (laughs) and but also like the key point the consumers I think um, I think that whole product market or service market fit concept Mm. is something that's really applicable like because even if you took out the Royal Commission a lot of these changes that people will be doing in reaction to the Royal Commission are actually things that need to happen to become better businesses Mm. anyway yeah yeah so like the way people want to consume advice and like what sort of services they want Mm. what sort of what sort of value they want to get out of it yeah um yeah so like i I guess yeah i've had i've had a couple of especially um advisors where they've been doing like broking and Mm. advice and those guys they're already they're an advisor so they're already feeling pretty vulnerable but then they're then they're, the, they're this mortgage broker that's just getting yeah. kicked in the ball sort <laughs> yeah, of thing as well. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, it's sort of, I've been talking about the concept of like, um, like advisors have expanded their, uh, their services offering to try mm. and appeal to, to obviously seeing value in different areas like cash flow and other areas. But it's also an opportunity for mortgage brokers mm. to sort of add value in, I was talking to them about how they could do like, 
preparation for lending like how do you that whole process that you go through working out like Mm. getting ready for the lender that could be a whole service that could be delivered that would people would get heaps of value out because the way that it often if you don't have a broker it it's um it can be often i don't know not necessarily as smooth as you'd Mm. like it to be uh what do you think about the broking side of things well, my, so my understanding is that, uh, you know, the government has, has effectively deferred, you know, the, the broking commission aspect for three years. Mm. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, if I was a broker, I'd be hoping that the Liberals get back into government because I suspect, you know, that's code for let's leave it until everyone's forgotten about the Royal Commission and we'll sweep it under the carpet. Um, uh, because I think there's some significant problems with just unwinding the broking industry. And, and uh, you know, I think there's some challenges for them, uh, you know, if commissions and trials are just completely abolished. Um, so uh, perhaps there's more to worry about if Labor get in, uh, you know, and, and perhaps they'll be more, uh, you know, militaristic in the way that they uh, implement some of that stuff. But, yeah, you know, I do think that these are the opportunities to relook at your business model and think about how can we add value and what can we do better and what do we do well and how do we leverage off that? Absolutely. So, and it's probably something, you know, we all need to do all the time. You know, a small business, we need to continually evolve. So... Have you made, like, after the release, is there any key changes to your strategy going forward this year in your financial advice business that have changed? Or? Um, not, not in a significant way. Um, you know, if there's anything for us, it's probably around marketing, I think. Um, we made um, a lot of changes back in about 2009 to the business. Uh, and and at, at that point, we really wanted to move away from all product-based fees um, at that time. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that's happened, like fee disclosure statements, et cetera, over the uh, you know over recent years, um, we've we've kind of already been in front of that um, mm-hmm. because we use an annual engagement with all the clients. Uh, all our revenue comes from the client. Uh, we requote every year, mm-hmm. um, and in effect, what we do is we we reconfirm with the client every twelve months how we're going to add value for you, mm-hmm. um, and 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 we want to add significant value every year, and so. When you're having those discussions, what it uh, what it evolves is is um, I guess your thinking starts to be around how do we add more value? Mm. You know, what what do we do that we could do better, or what don't we do that we should be doing or could mm. be doing? Um, whether that's uh, you know in house and do we need to get a broader skill set or an improved skill set, or or are there relationships we need outside the business that we can bring in so we've got the expertise we need to come up with solutions. Um, but I think that's probably you know that, that was really the first step for us in moving away from product. Um, so you so you've been doing this annual renewal. How long have you been doing that for? Uh, about nine years. Okay, mm, long time. Yeah. So well before you know it probably became the FIFA service catchphrase came in. I yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's there's a there's plenty of good reasons to have you on the podcast. But I think in terms of timing, there's a lot of advisors out there where that is a really scary proposition. Mm. And I'd I'd love to if you don't mind sharing, sort of delving into a bit of how you've done it what that looks like a bit of so really something that advisors could take away going okay scott's been doing this i'm gonna have a crack at that yeah i think that you know i mean and i think i've been in that position where i could imagine myself scared of being where i am today Mm. uh, as far as the business model goes um and in part i think you know that's not enough confidence about there is a lot of value in what we actually do um and you know i've been in the industry a long time uh 20 years, I think it might be this year, actually. Um, uh, I know I look young. Uh, <laughs> well, but, anyone watching YouTube, you can see, but guys that are on the, the audio, uh, yeah. He's a, I, you wouldn't think he's been around that picture long. Of picture. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, um, I think, a matter of, of understanding and being able to articulate well what is the value that we add. And if you can get better at that, then all of a sudden charging for your services becomes a lot easier. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've talked to advisors occasionally about, you know, because it's one of those topics, you know, well, how much do you charge? Mm. Um, and it is how much is a, you know, is, how long is a piece of string? But um, uh, a lot of advisors get scared when you start talking about ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year for mm-hmm. clients. Um, but in our experience, they pay it as long as you can show the value and, and articulate that well. Um, and a lot of this comes back to actually understanding 
what are the outcomes that clients really want? Mm. Um, and, and so that conversation's got to be really rich and deep um, mm-hmm. because ultimately when we're uh, uh, holding these discussions and we're providing a terms of engagement letter cli- to clients, we're really, uh, you know, to begin with, really quoting that information back to them and saying our understanding is these are the things that are important to you and there's got to be some detail in that. Um, and then I think the link is how do you get the advice to marry up to all of that and actually show them how you can help them. Yeah. So I guess one of the things, like I always like to think that if you can get the right, there's a few key processes or ways of doing things from a, a functional standpoint or a documentation standpoint, that if you get that methodology, then that gets you in that direction. How much is the process that you guys go through versus the conversations you have? Yeah. Because obviously the conversations provide the inputs into that framework how much can like I love the idea of being able to go okay if we give give advisors that haven't tried this we give them the right framework then they'll start to gravitate into that and have the conversations that feed that what's your perspective on that is it is it just something that you can't that won't work or um so it's a really good question um so so the way that I went about it is, is I fixed my engagement with the client first because ultimately if you don't get that right the clients don't sign up so it doesn't matter how good your framework is afterwards mm. it becomes irrelevant and, and there's a there is a confidence issue there you know if if you change the way you engage with a client and you change the way you charge them you've never done it before the most nervous person in the office will be you it's not the client they've mm. got no idea um, they, they don't know you don't do this uh, yep. or haven't done this a million times before so you're the nervous one and if you if you don't sign up that first you know one or two or maybe three clients the tendency is to go, oh, God, you know, I'm not doing this well enough. It doesn't work. I'll throw it in the bin and I'll go back to my old ways. And so, you know, they're, they're, you need a bit of confidence. You need a bit of discipline to stick with, you know, to stick with it. Um, and, and pricing is hard um, mm. for everyone, for you and for the clients because often they don't really reference. They don't know, you know, is this fee going to be $1,000 or $15,000? they guessing, uh, yep. basically. Um, so... So we started with fix the engagement, get the conversations better, understand um, uh, in a lot of detail what they're actually wanting from us. And then we spent a lot of years getting the process better. And, and you know, I mean, I guess in my experience is that's facilitated us being able to increase our fees um, because yep. we, we, we do more now than we did nine years ago um, and we do it a hell of a lot better. Um, and... and That'll never stop. You know, we still have regular meetings in the office to sit down and go, okay, what doesn't work in this in this business or in this office today? Mm-hmm. What are the roadblocks we've got? Why aren't things progressing the way we want them to progress? And then what can we do about it? Is it process driven? Is it a skill issue? You know, what is it and how do we fix it? Um, and you never stop doing that. I think that confidence aspect that you mentioned is a, is a key mm. key part because you talk to... Like I went through that journey of changing from, well, I got taught to like insurance advice. That bit was commissions and yeah. that was the framework. And I was like, I want to try this fee. Like I'm pretty adventurous. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try this fee for service thing. Mm-hmm. But you're right. That Like you, you're the one that's actually got the gap in perception of whatever value is going on in the room. Yeah. Because there's plenty of advisors out there. They do things completely different ways. What's consistent is that they believe what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And the gap that emerges when someone's trying something new is that you've really got to regain that belief in yourself yep. and the belief that you're on the right path and I guess see those client outcomes also see the, not necessarily the client outcomes but the client um, uh, the, see the end of that service and that the clients still happy they're happy yes. they've enjoyed the service and that you feel you then start to feel that you mm. went down the right path yep so I think yeah, that's really... And when I think about that, I go, well, for a lot of people, then they're not really willing to jump, do a significant leap. Yeah. So what are the baby steps to... Like, if you were going to go, okay, there's a there's a practice out there that's got... They do they do fee-for-service around insurance. A lot of the fees come out... Of, uh, sorry, fee-for-service around superannuation, investments, mm-hmm. and that part of the advice, they might do some cash flow activity. Um, part of the fees come out of superannuation, that's another thing to discuss later on. Yes. Uh, and and insurance is commission. They might have started um, charging maybe an implementation fee mm-hmm. or a small yep. fee. For these people to completely let go of insurance commissions, what do you reckon the first step is? So, yeah, I, I, I think that you um, it's much harder 
to uh, go back to your existing clients and try and change the way you, you've engaged with them. Um, it can certainly be done, um, but it's a lot harder than than dealing with a brand new client that's never met you before and has no idea what you do. Mm. Um, so I think step one is to trial something with your new clients, the, the people that haven't met you before. Um, uh, the other thing um, uh, that we've done uh, as, as a business, and, and not everyone will necessarily agree with this, but we're really strict with it, is um, we don't do any transactional work at all and yeah. haven't done for years so if somebody came, comes into us and says look I just want you to tell me um, an answer to this one question or, or provide a solution for this one issue I don't want you to look at anything else we refer them off um, yeah. because um, you know underlying is we want to provide significant value and I don't think you can if the client puts blinkers on you and says just deal with this one issue for me mm. and then what happens is you become uh, you put under a lot of pressure on the price mm -hmm. because the client wants to drill you down I want the solution or the answer to this for the che cheapest possible price yeah, you put into this commoditized space yeah they're not looking for a relationship mm. um, and so you kind of become you know the ITP of the financial planning world um and that, that, I guess, you know, there, there may be firms out there who will make that very successful, but it's not us. Um, and we don't want to have 400 advisors around the country. So um, so we've always stayed well clear of that. Um, and, and what that's allowed us to do is to think more broadly about, well, these are the outcomes you, you want. If we want to maximise the probability of you achieving all of this, we have to look at all of this stuff. Because mm. if we leave the superannuation out or we leave the insurance out or the estate planning or the cash flow out all of a sudden it starts to break down. Um, and our experience with the way that we charge and the way that we engage is as soon as the client starts saying, look, I don't want to do that or this or this, I just want you to do this bit and this bit, um, and we've, we've made the mistake of going, okay, well, we'll do this, and it's always ended in disaster because the value proposition breaks down too much and then the yeah. fee looks expensive to the client. Um, uh, and so we haven't done that for many years now. Um, yeah. uh, how, how long ago, I guess, when did you first start that sort of transition? Like, when did you go... Like, what was, what was the start like when you first came into advice? Let's, let's have a look at that. So when I first came into uh, the advice industry, um, I, well, I was actually I was actually working as a um, lending uh, specialist in in the Commonwealth Bank. So okay. you know I, I was there at the time when you know mortgage broking was you know mobile lenders as they called them in the bank. Uh, you know it was relatively new. Um, I was there when they bought Colonial First State, so we've just kind of almost come the full circle now with them uh, you know exiting Colonial. Um, and, and, you know, the bank transformed immensely um, uh, around those years that, that I was uh, uh, sort of transitioning into the advice industry. So there were no financial planners when I joined the Commonwealth Bank. Um, this was a new thing. And, and I remember talking to one of the managers about, look, I want to make this change um, and get across into the advice uh, side of things. It probably took about a year before, you know, I got across there and um, this is in WA. Yeah. Um, so they sent me over to Sydney, never never left the state prior to that. I uh, know I might have been to Queensland actually, but came to Sydney, uh, it was around the time of the Olympics actually. Um, so it was all very, you know, my goodness, it's a big it's a city. bright light. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Was it, were you coming from uh, Perth or a rural area? Uh, no, I was coming from Perth, yeah, okay. yeah. Although I was born in a you, Perth back then probably was a bit more rural. <laughs> yeah, I was still a decent sized city. It was, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Was still, <laughs> still plenty of skyscrapers. So more, probably bigger, a lot bigger than Canberra, anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it was all you know. The, the financial planning industry back then was was you know oh god, not not long out of door to door you know insurance salesman mm. really. Um, uh, so it was in its infancy, um, and you know I, I, I probably spent um, oh, I don't know seven or eight years, I guess, uh, in the Commonwealth Bank and then into um, a stockbroking firm and then a smaller financial planning business in Canberra when I'd moved. And I remember, you know, sitting there one day thinking, um, and this is talking about what we are talking about before, mm. what value do I add? Like, mm. I, I literally feel like I'm just, you know, regardless of who the client is, I'm just flogging them a managed fund mm -hmm. and maybe some insurance. 
and it's rinse and repeat day in, day out. And I was really disenfranchised at that point, thinking there's got to be more to the industry than this. Um, to the point where you're almost, you know, embarrassed to talk to somebody at a barbecue about, you know, what do you do? I'm a financial planner. Um, uh, you know, and you're almost scared of the conversation about, you know, well, tell me in detail what you do because you're kind of thinking, oh, I've got to just flog some product. You know, that, that's how bad it was. Um, uh, it's certainly in my experience anyway. Um, so when I made the decision to get out and, and start my own business, what I wanted to do was to move away from product, um, but it took me a few years. You know, I'd, I, at that point in time, I looked around at what everyone else was doing, and 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 you know, probably some of this still goes on today, where you've got different service package offerings from platinum and gold and bronze or whatever you want to call them. And I remember thinking about it and going, but how would I get a client from the bottom package to the top package? Why would they start paying me more for different, you know, for What's the difference? for a newsletter or you know, like it because that's what it was in those days. And I thought, that just doesn't work. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And I ran the numbers and I thought, I'll never make any money um, by, by, adopting, by adopting a strategy like that. Um, uh, and, of course, if you don't make money, you can't grow. Mm. Um, and, and so I, and I didn't want to sit in an office by myself for the next 20 years. Um, so it, it, it took a few years before I finally kind of um, uh, started to work out a, a way to do this. Um, uh, and 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 start to get back to you know the value is all on the client um, conversation the client's head you know we've got to get it out of them um, and we've got to have better conversations to do that so so that was kind of the transition I guess for me into into uh, where we've got the business now and it's, it's it's been you know the best part of ten years um, and I think we had our training wheels on for probably the first two to three years. Do you remember the first time that you had the discussion <laughs> about about fee for service insurance? Uh, well, I've never had one because I've always been a, 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 a you know a, a broader business than that. So I've never just isolated the insurance um, uh, and dealt with the client from from a fee for service kind of proposition. Um, uh, you know, when we converted to 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 this style of operation, I guess um, we're always more holistic than that. So yeah. So not taking commission. Um, so we, uh, for those first two years in business, we were using commission. So in that period when we were trying to struggle to work out how to get to where we wanted to get to, yeah. we were still using an asset-based fee uh, on, okay. the, on the fund side and a commission on the insurance side. Um, I think it was about two years. Um, mm. and, and on that day, I literally drew a line in the sand and have never gone back. Yeah. Not once. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and because the business has been around for about a little yeah 11 and a half years now um uh a few years ago we, we got to the point where we said right that's it we're, we're we're eliminating all the commission um legacy stuff we had in the business because it wasn't you know significant i think it was about two percent of revenue okay um so we literally just said right that's it it's all going so we either converted the clients to our terms of engagement or we simply removed us we advised the client we couldn't service and we removed ourselves as the advisor okay um, and we've been very, very strict about never swaying from that. You've been so. Very ahead of the Royal Commission on that one. Yeah, yeah. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yep, yep. So we don't have any of those sort of um, complications, I guess. It's, it's interesting when you talk about the breadth of services that you you didn't feel that it was a big leap because you, I guess, because you had so much value in other areas. So there's, there's probably a bit in in that in terms of, I guess. The scoping of what you do as an advisor, mm -hmm. maybe that's one of the first steps to broaden. Like, okay, so maybe you don't have to jump straight into um, no comms for insurance. You may maybe just start expanding the value proposition. Because I remember when I started um, with the insurance discussion, mm -hmm. okay, fee for service. Okay, the first what I went into first was actually going. Um, well, these are the two. These are the two options. Actually, no, sorry. I didn't even go. I, I went, okay, fuck it. Let's go all in. But in once I've, when, I've, when I've talked to other advisors, I said, okay, just start having that discussion first mm -hmm. about commission and no commission. And the, the dis just having that discussion allows you to under unpack the value chain or what's been delivered there. And you start to, just by going through that process, it's really powerful mm -hmm. to... Yeah that discussion you start talking to the client and the discussions with the client like it's it's a real like it really puts things on a level of value for the insurance mm -hmm. advice so you really start to instead of it sort of not swept under the table exactly but not fully being um, understood by the client in terms or 
the significance yeah. of this service, mm. like and and that they are uh, the the necessity to value it wasn't put there isn't always put there with commissions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny, you know, that if if I was a risk only advisor, there is an awful lot of similarity to you know the discussion now with mortgage brokers because you're dealing with um, you know a, a single suite of products um, and you're dealing with a product suite the client can get without you. So you can go to the bank and get a home loan, or you can go to a mortgage broker. You can go straight to the insurance company and get an insurance product too, if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the value is in the, the advice that you can provide to the, to the client and to sort through the mess. And of course, clients are busy, um, and and the busier the client, the more they're going to want to pay someone else to deal with all these issues. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of similarity I think between the challenges for risk advisors, and, and, and they've probably been thinking about it longer than what the mortgage brokers have. But mm. yeah, very similar complications, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and I think it's yeah, and that and the requirement to put a price on there is one thing. That's a whole process around that in terms mm. of how much do you charge and yep. what do you set there. And even even when I went through that process, it was really it was quite significant because you get to sort of go, okay, well. Shit, how much? Like a lot of businesses, and the challenge with a lot of businesses, especially if you're a small business, is really being accountable around how much cost, yeah, how much things cost to deliver. Mm. Because across the board, advisors are really good at underestimating that. Absolutely, yeah, they're absolutely. really good at forgetting about how much time they spent thinking about something, like in the morning yes. that related to this one client. Um, even underestimating like admin time and yes. things like that. It's absolutely. Just, and once you start, yeah, it's a scary space because, mm. and, they'll, and you can understand why a lot of people don't go into it because it's quite depressing once you actually jump back yeah, the numbers. Yeah, yeah, you, you do almost need someone else to push you on price. Um, you do. Because most people aren't going to have enough courage to push themselves far enough on from a price perspective. Um, but, you know, with, with the risk um, advice, one advantage you do have is if you pull the commission out, the premiums drop. Um, that's not the case with a home loan. So mm. you pull the, pull the commission out, uh, you don't instantly get this drop in the home loan rate. Um, exactly. So, you know, you, you, you can represent, um, you know, an, an insurance recommendation as this is the cost for these benefits and this product. Um, and, and You say 25% for the loan? Yeah, the when life, you say 25 or 30% of those premiums, you know, that equation starts to look very attractive. Mm. Um, uh, and the, and then, you're, then you're simply um, uh, getting the client to understand that there's significant value in you providing all the advice because there's a million options and a heap of different type of insurance mm. and all the different variables uh, in setting those policies up. Uh, so, make, you know, making that easy the for the client. the significance of the commitment. Correct. Uh, yes. And having you on, on their side. So, you know, we, we know uh, some of the banks got into trouble because effectively um, the advisors who are selling the insurance product were working for the bank, not for the consumer. Mm. And so when there's a claims issue... That advisor can't push too hard because they uh, effectively have to... Too uh, close to... Correct. So the boss says, uh, that's it, it's done. And the advisor has to go, okay, no problem. Um, You know, for us, uh, if we're not happy, we can can continue to push and continue to shout. Um, You know, we fight for the clients. So there's there's a lot of value in in that. Mm. On the broking side of things, I I was doing broking for a bit and Mm. I I, had gone through this insurance fee-for-service process and I was like, okay... So let's see what we can do around this for more years. So I can set a fixed fee. Doesn't mean so I'm not fucking around, not getting paid. Yep. Like when, because I used to just sit there when a loan, you wouldn't get the loan done. And arguably, you could argue that, oh, that's, you're a green mortgage broker. What a rookie. Yeah, you got yeah. to that stage and you didn't get the loan done. Yeah. But I was just sitting there going, well, we do all the, the, the work. I, I actually just got so frustrated by the work being so front loaded. I'm mm. like, this is bullshit. Like, yeah. I don't want to get paid any... I don't want to start doing stuff unless I know I'm going to get paid. Yes, absolutely. It's a really my... I, I started exploring that just purely out of that frustration. Mm. I'm like, I don't want to operate like this. I want, it, I want everything I commit to with clients to be... Profitable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because... You know, we're an industry that's always come from this concept of um, of cross subsidisation. Mm. You, know, you know, swings and roundabouts. Yeah, we, we've all we've all um, experienced the concept of oh, look, I'll take this client on because in ten years' time they might be a good client. I won't make any money on them for ten years. 
Um, and the problem with that is that some percentage of your whole client book is 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 uh, you know losing money. Um, and whilst the, yes, some of those might become good clients later on, you're replacing them with clients that still are losing money. Um, mm. And so you know that 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 in my view is not a great way to run a business. Uh, you know the, it should be profitable and valuable for everyone. You as a business, um, uh, you know yes, you might do pro bono work. But that should be very clear, um, and should, you know you should make some decision about this is the level of pro bono work we'll do, uh, and and you think differently about you know what's the nature of that work and how do you want to engage and who do you want to engage with. Um, but if it's not pro bono work, it should be profitable work. Um, yeah, totally. And, and then you need to show the value um, to that client. Mm. On that that mortgage side of things, I was like, I actually came up against the wall because mm-hmm. I was like, because as you said before, you. You, you can't strip out the structure of the broking in like yep. um, of lending. Yep. It's not structurally um, set up to be able to dial down. Mm. So I'm just in there going, Can I, how do I do this? So I was asking yeah. next people and then I'm getting messages that, gee, you got to be careful because you get like they actually stomp on you from a like aggregator, the lenders. Yep. Because they all want to keep that structure. Mm. So like it's, before your time. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously different different reasons for going down that path. I was yeah. more self-centered, but um, because I was just frustrated about I just yeah, wanted to charge yeah. a fee and get paid. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, for the work you do. Yeah. 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 Um, Crazy idea. <laughs> I, yeah. But I guess I guess the and that that's that's one way to go about it in terms of and that's what like I, I suppose I'd encourage advisors to just think about just get really selfish about like I think what holds a lot of advisors get torn between the ideological side of things mm. in terms of I won't be able to service clients and that's that's what you hear from people and yeah. and it's true you can't mm. and it's heartbreaking for a lot of people and it's really frustrating and like a lot of people get into advice because they want to do that mm. yeah so that's I, like I see that as a, one of the biggest impediments of people actually not wanting to like being less um, I guess ideological about what an advisor mm. can do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an oxymoron, isn't it, when we talk about inactive clients? You know, that, that, that phrase always gets me, and, and it's been talked about a lot, mm. you know, in the last 12 or 18 months, but inactive client, that's not a client. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just not a client. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah, well, it's... it's um, so, so in terms of... So we talked about the sort of the commission side of things. What about service proposition? So, like, you're, you've been really specialising in cash flow management. And mm-hmm. You've really... Uh, my understanding from our previous chats is like you've got it as a cornerstone of, I guess, the process, and I, I'm going to guess that it's like it's like actually one of the foundational elements of when you start to work with the client. Absolutely, yeah. It has it has and it has been for a while now. Um, you know, I guess we don't really want to give clients fairy tale advice. You know, it's advice that's based on um, numbers that aren't real uh, uh, with projections that are out over many years about assumptions that really, you know, are hard to kind of narrow down. And, and you know, I, I'd spent some time, you know, delivering advice to clients in previous years and then looking at kind of the blank look on their face and you can, and you can see that they're thinking, well, we don't have that much money even though you've confirmed in the meeting prior that this is how much we spend Mm. and you can work it all out pretty easily uh, with how much money should be available. And they go, yeah, we've got none of that money. Yeah, well, you've got like $25,000 a year here you're using for all these different things. Uh, We don't have a single cent. Um, and, And so, you know, without the cash flow piece... The, the, all the advice you do, you know, is just not valuable. Um, and so we want to deliver advice that we know can actually be implemented um, because we deal with enough variables that we can't control, um, and that's one that you can. Um, and if, if you're trying to move your business away from product-based fees and product-based advice, it's a really good starting point. Um, and we had a client only a few weeks ago, a young professional, and we, do, we tend to do a lot of work with that sort of demographic. Um, and he said to us um, uh, after we presented our terms of engagement letter, he said, this cash flow stuff is the most important thing I think that you guys can help us with. So all the other stuff we talked about, the cash flow was the one thing he highlighted to us, um, which you know, is almost the opposite of, of the old business model where, you know, some advisors that say, we only work with engineers who earn 300 grand a year and have $2 million to invest. You know, it, it's the opposite because these young professionals, they don't really have any money to invest. Mm. Um, but what they, what they are conscious of 
um, and they tend to be quite aspirational, is uh, I earn all this money, but I don't know where it all goes. Um, and, I, I, and they're smart enough to realise that if they keep repeating what they've been doing, in 10 years' time, they won't be anywhere um, and they don't want to be in that position. So that, that cash flow piece is really critical. And it fits from our experience into most of the client demographics, but perhaps in slightly different ways. Mm. You know, the, the way we, you, we do cash flow with a retiree is very different and, and you know, I think less valuable, but still valuable mm. than what it might be for, say, a young professional. And as long as you understand that and you price that accordingly, you can still do this work for, for most clients. Um, How do the engagement steps work with that? So if, if, if an... To, for an advisor out there to understand how you how that process works an initial engagement with the client how does it look yeah we um, so when when we talk to clients um, uh, about cash flow in our terms of engagement letter we actually kind of kick it off with uh, a pretty uh, upfront statement um, pretty confronting statement actually um, and uh, we'll occasionally get a smile out of the clients as we go through it. But we basically say to nearly all of them, because it's the truth for basically all of them, um, we feel there's a lack of discipline um, uh, in regard to your cash flow. Um, and, and, and so that's a pretty, you know, you're trying to get this client on board. That's not telling them something warm and fuzzy. That's telling them something a bit prickly. Mm. Um, but it's the honest truth. And, you know, we've actually had clients sign up off that statement alone because they, at the end of the engagement, they go, you're exactly right. That's exactly one of the problems that we have um, so they realize that you shouldn't be scared to talk about it um, and in fact that's probably one of the areas that we have um, uh, looked to ensure we always do is to give the clients the advice uh, not they necessarily want to hear but the advice they mm. need to hear um, and so again that's you know th- that can well, be at that stage it's just general advice so. No, no, no. So not at that point, but oh, okay. yeah, when we get to the advice component, though. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we've all had clients where you know that, in fact, we had one the other day and we lost this client. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, they're 12 months from retirement. Um, they're taking one third of their total retirement nest egg um, and they've bought an off the plan apartment mm-hmm. um, for the daughter to live in. Um, and, and, and we looked at that and thought, oh my God, this is a terrible, terrible idea for a, a bunch of different reasons. Um, uh, and, and so we wanted to raise this with a client and we wouldn't normally do that at that point but um, we, we got a conversation and going in a bit more detail about you know what was the motivation behind this purchase because they hadn't exchanged contract yet and they were about to do that so mm. we wanted at least a chance to, to get them to think about what they were doing and we talked about the pros and cons uh, of the idea um, uh, and so that you know that, that was uh, I guess a bit of a confronting conversation, uh, and we're effectively saying to the client um, that you know have you really thought this through? Um, and they hadn't, uh, mm. as most clients don't. Uh, uh, you know these tend to be emotional um, purchases, uh, which is very frustrating when someone comes in to get advice from you, and yet they've already made some really key decisions right before they come and talk to you. Um, but yeah, having those conversations that clients don't want to hear is actually really is a really core and valuable part of it of being an advisor I think so does that so would you say the majority of clients come through there is um, a, a, you would you would make a I guess a call to them saying this party situation is in not which this 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 is that how you go about not it? Not always. No, not always. Um, we always do with the cash flow side of things. I mean, you know, if, if you think about... So cash flow, you beat him over the head. Cash flow, we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, or smack uh, them on the wrist. Because, because, well, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a behavioural problem. And, and it's of all the things um, uh, that are likely to be stopping any client from progressing financially, that's the one. Um, it's not because they've got the wrong super fund and it, it's not because um, they've bought the wrong property or they've got the wrong share portfolio. It's far more likely that they've got a cash flow and spending problem. Um, mm. And so that is one that you kind of need to um, uh, upfront, get out there and say, we really think this needs to be done a hell of a lot better. Um, uh, and it does resonate well with a lot of clients. Um, well, if nothing gets done around that space, your toolkit for what you can do to their situation is very limited. Correct. And, and you know, one of the things that we we, um, we debrief after our initial meeting with a client um, is, well, these clients actually take advice because we don't want to engage with someone, spend hours and hours and hours constructing all the advice for them um, and then have them go, no, I don't want to do any of that. Um, you know, so it's you know really critical, I think, to have a think about, and you get a pretty good feel through the meeting. Um, you know, will these clients actually listen and and look to engage with the advice you give? Do they actually want advice? 
because strangely enough, some clients actually don't want advice, uh, even though they come in to see you. They, they like the idea initially, yeah, yeah. but when they, when they find out what it is, oh, I've got to change my situation. No, no way. I don't want to do any of that. No, no, I'm just going to leave it all as this. Uh, no, you were meant to just make, make everything grow yeah, bigger. Yeah, and right. I was just going to continue living how I've been doing things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that cash flow discussion, you know, um, uh, is about being pretty upfront about it. Uh, you know, almost no one um, uh, runs a cash flow budget. You would say is in any way accurate. Um, mm. You get that occasional engineer personality that comes in with a spreadsheet that's you know so complicated you, you can't even read it. Um, but in general, most people either don't have one at all. Or it's something scribbled down on a bit of paper with about nine different expense categories. And you go, hang on, what about gifts and haircuts and doctors and physio? None of this stuff's on this budget. And you're telling me you spent 35 grand a year with a family of four. Oh, it's interesting. (laughs) It's not right. Statistically, that doesn't matter. So, so, but you know, you, you think about listed companies in the stock market, how many of them don't have a budget? I'd probably guess zero. Mm. And then you flip it over to our personal circumstances and it's almost the exact opposite. Almost zero of us have, you know, in today's age, there's technology. So there's not really the excuse now that we probably had maybe 10 or 15 years ago where you had to use access to access to information. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's easily there. Because no one's going to spend three hours a week keeping a cash flow budget. That's for sure. I wouldn't no. do that. Well, unless those engineer clients. That's a, Except those occasionally. Don't like watching clients. TV, spreadsheet gets them <laughs> that's off. That's right. Uh, they love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it, it sent you on this It sent you on this journey. You, you've acknowledged cash flow is significant. And I guess there's a great segue into what you started where you started to explore mm. and come up against walls in that space and where it got to another thing that you're doing, which is uh, an, up, an app for cash flow. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so as I said before, we, we spent a lot of time kind of looking at what's n- not working in the business and how do we fix it. Um, and we kind of uh, ended up getting to cash flow uh, and it wasn't working at all. And in fact, the process that we we were using was almost driving a wedge between us and the clients. Um, and if anyone's done cash flow budgeting work with clients, uh, they probably know the problem of trying to get clients to keep the technology up to date, mm-hmm. reconciling transactions. Um, uh, and and it's something that um, uh, can become a problem if you're saying to a client, oh, you've got you know 900 transactions we need you to reconcile again mm-hmm. um, in preparation for our next chat. Um, uh, because of course, if you don't have the numbers, there's a problem with your delivery of service Um, and clients might do it the first time they might do it the second time but after maybe 18 months it just falls over they don't do it anymore Um, uh, so we said okay our technology solution isn't working we need a better one Um, uh, but we just want a cash flow solution Hmm. Um, so we went out and kind of had a look at all the options and we talked to lots of advisors about what they were doing and and what they felt was working really well with that cash flow work um, and, and we couldn't find anything that, that sort of did what we wanted it to do. Um, not that it was that complicated. We just wanted something that was really easy for the client to use. Mm. Um, uh, didn't require hours and hours of our time to uh, get some useful data out of um, and would give us the information we wanted about the clients so that we could have better conversations really with the clients. Um, because ultimately... You know, we're trying to change behaviours, and that's not very easy. It's it's like you know, imagine if your business was trying to stop people smoking or stop people gambling. Um, you know, if they have that problem, it's incredibly difficult to get them to change. So if you're going to try and change someone's cash flow behaviours, you need the information at hand. Uh, if that takes you hours and hours for every client to put together, you know. You, you, it's a problem because uh, we're trying to be profitable businesses uh, and then the cost of delivering that service goes up and so it becomes you know a a question of can you deliver this in a valuable way to the client Mm. Um, so in the end uh, uh, we bit the bullet and started work on our own uh, technology app Um, and, and that has been a challenging journey uh, and, and it takes some time, uh, but we're finally kind of there um, and rolling that out to our clients now. Uh, and and it's, it's doing the things that we wanted it to do, um, particularly around being very, very simple to use. Um, from, from the perspective that um, as the advisor, we really don't have to set anything up, um, mm-hmm. it, not even the budgets if we don't want to. The, the system will, will do the budgeting for us. Um, we've got a portal where we can see all our clients. We can see which ones we should be talking to because there's some issues around meeting budget. Yep. Um, 
um, uh, and, and, and all the time we spend on cash flow work now can be the actual conversation with the client or something valuable for the client rather than you know banging away doing some form of administrative doing work doing the work or, yeah, yeah. Or, or getting the admin staff to be chasing up clients you know so reconciling, reconciling and, and, what yeah. was that item was, yeah, yeah correct so um, so how so you're you're essentially you've got a um, an output that or a, a dashboard that tells you everything that's at risk or any clients that are yeah you've, you've created you've worked out you've gone okay well with your experience you've gone okay when that happens, that's an issue. When that happens, that's an issue. Yes. So, so you know, if you think about budgeting in its simplest form, it's just simply knowing how much you spend. But you almost know that by default by how much someone's saving. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so how much you spend is not very useful. Um, uh, and, and even, you know, telling a client how much they spend and where that money goes <clears throat> is also not that helpful um, because the first question we get asked by a lot of clients is, okay, so what does that mean? And you're like, well, it just means you spend that much money in all these different categories. And they're like, okay. You know, and it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I really so, enjoyed that category. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was good. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that we found more helpful is to be able to say to them, well, you're spending uh, uh, 50% more on eating out than you do on groceries. Uh, and when we look at the rest of our clients, you're spending double what on average they're spending and clients kind of look at you and go oh right I, I didn't get it but I get it right we've got a problem and you go yes we, we have a problem we've got a benchmark yeah. um, and we wanted to filter that so that we could you know if they're a family of four well let's compare you to other families of four that we work with or Single. Is it just? Are you looking internally in your business for that? Benchmark? Yeah, so it's yeah. it's in the it's in the app data for the client group. So for our yeah. business, we can see our clients, um, uh, and we can still filter that for because we work uh, a lot with um, clients in Queensland and New South Wales and some rural areas. So we can still filter that out as well um, uh, if we want to look at our clients in Queensland or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, we would really wanted to give them, um, you know, because it, it's more powerful to tell a client how they compare to someone else. Um, than just to simply tell them the numbers. Um, and we've been doing cash flow work for probably about six or seven years now. Um, so it was one of the things we we added, um, uh, you know, in those first couple of years of converting our business into this engagement model. Um, uh, so it was one of those areas we highlighted as we really need to start doing this and doing it really well. Um, and so, yeah, it was one of the kind of journeys that we went through and the learning uh, outcomes that we got was uh, you need a bit more than just simply telling them where the money goes because mm. um, you can't get them to change their spending by doing that. Um, and so some clients you need to contact all the time and some clients uh, you don't need to contact much at all uh, because maybe they're very good with their cash flow and maybe what they're spending is perfectly okay and maybe you actually want them to spend that much money because some retirees, you know, they want confirmation that this is okay. Well, I was going um, to talk about that and the demographics difference. My experience was that you'd, you'd sort of end up with people that were really good savers in retirement and all, all through their life and they're, yeah. they're set up for a nice retirement but that behaviour that's been yeah, in place for stop. so long, yeah. it's like, spend that money. We'd yes. have a conversation, get the new bathroom, it's okay. That's right, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We, you know, um, we've got a few clients like that that we kind of have to encourage that, you know, this is okay to, for you to spend this money. Um, and how about that holiday we've been talking about for three years? We think you should do it. Um, you mm-hmm. know, let's let's actually do some planning around booking it in. You know, so maybe some noti- positive notifications going, has not spent enough. Yes, that's like right. You're system. not spending enough on travel. Um, absolutely. So, so yeah, you know, we're working with a retired client. The value in this cash flow work with them is is less, um, but there's still a role for it. Um, it's a lot more valuable for some other demographics, absolutely, um, particularly those clients that have a real spending problem. Mm. Well, I love stuff that's developed from the ground up with a core problem that's been identified at, um, yeah, at the ground floor face-to-face with the client yeah just working back from the client instead of um, I guess coming in at a higher level with a concept that's maybe sometimes disconnected from what's going on on the ground so what what's it called Scott Savvy Savvy so, Savvy so uh, yeah so the uh, w- the web portal is Savvy app 
uh, .com.au. Um, and so we've got a few parts. We've got the mobile app uh, that the clients can download and anyone can download that for free. Um, uh, it's, it's on the app stores and the Google Play Store. Um, and so that's free. Uh, if you want to get that client's data or, or, or that user's data, um, we've, we'll generate a, a, an advisor code um, and they simply put that into the app and that will feed across into the web portal that you log into with all of your clients listed there. So you've so, got a so dedicated system. So simple pull through. Yeah, so there's no setup. There's no client setup. Um, okay. You don't do anything. You just get them to put that code in. Yep. And, you know, some clients are pretty bad at following instructions. So worst case scenario, you might do it whilst they're in the office with you next, totally. the next meeting. Yeah. So they don't have to log into each of the... Yes. They do have to log into the bank still, okay. um, but that's a that's a um, it, it, well. The reason I, I uh, made the final decision to go ahead and, and develop this technology was that open banking was coming. Mm. Um, so until open banking is fully rolled out, um, you will always have to log into your to your institution through a data aggregator. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so the app uses a data aggregator um, to to get that information. Um, so the app itself doesn't doesn't um, integrate with the bank. The data aggregator is doing that, um, yeah. and they've already got those API feeds there. Um, uh, we're, we're just getting that information then from the data aggregator. Um, so the app itself doesn't log into your bank or anything like that. Um, but yeah, once open banking rolls out, the difference will be uh, no more logging in to, to set it up mm-hmm. uh, to the bank. Uh, and the data will feed live, so mm. uh, so that's be a lot better quality. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, the, so the client, um, you know, will see it in the in the cash flow app um, seconds after they actually spend the money. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it, so exciting. it'll be that'll be uh, very exciting for the for that part of the industry. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, if an, if an advisor is curious about what you're doing, obviously, uh, a cash flow app developed by an advisor for their clients that is available for other advisors. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So they go to savvy.com. Yeah, oh, wait, so dot io. wait. Savvy, savvyapp.com.au yeah, yeah. Savvy so um, yeah that's right so uh, um, it, it, it's uh, uh, well we've got we've got a website set up for the app um, uh, it's very simple to use so what I'd probably suggest doing is actually download the app itself um, mm-hmm. and, and have a look at what your client's going to see um, we wanted to keep that so you can trial it without yeah sure. that's right so yeah. you could just download the app yourself um, uh, we've got no contracts or anything for the advisors so if they want to join up and, and, and throw their own um, data into the into the uh, feed mm-hmm. um, before they bring any client work in. Uh, they, they can do that and see how it works from both sides. Okay. Uh, and then if they've used it for a month ago, no, we don't like that. Um, that's fine. They just shut it back down. Uh, uh, worst case, they get charged ten bucks uh, mm-hmm. for, for a month, um, uh, and you know, uh, off they go. Learning learning journey, I guess. Um, but uh, but w- we develop that app for the client to only show them specific data and, and the information that, that they kind of want to see. Um, so you know, one of the key things we want all of our clients to see is. What's my uh, non-discretionary spending? What's the stuff that that I don't really want to spend, but I kind of have to? Mm. Um, petrol and and uh, insurance, etc. And what's my discretionary spending? How much am I spending on the fun things in life? Because uh, that's a really important uh, split between those categories. Totally. Uh, we don't have spending problems in those uh, non-discretionary areas. People don't spend more on groceries than they want to. Um, uh, so it's all the discretionary stuff. That's the area that, that you'll have. Well, that's where you problems. can reduce. That's where you got the... Correct, yeah, yeah. that's right. If you've, if you've got a spending problem, it's going to be more likely on clothes, travel, eating out, entertainment. Alcohol. Yeah, alcohol. Oh, wait, actually, <laughs> how do you categorize... Because entertainment as a categorization, mm. for someone that drinks a lot of, like, it's a... You're having a great entertaining time. Mm. Um, do you, do you, does alcohol go into entertainment or does it, do we identify alcoholics? Alcohol separate. Alcohol, it is. Alcohol separate out of the entertainment category. Has so. it been quite interesting once you've had that rise to the surface for some clients? So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all uh, you know. Some clients like uh, uh, you know, life's too short kind of attitude to uh, the cost of a bottle of wine, and, yeah. uh, and, and others are very different. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't had too many. Uh, Just trying to remember some of the bar names in Canberra. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Mounties. So it's, what was the one? Um, what would you be thinking of? Uh, uh, 
See, that's how often I go out to bars these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the closest thing is seeing them come up on your clients' um, yeah, that's transactions. Right. That's, that's yeah. right. Yeah, well, <laughs> well we, we've got a few clients where it's, you know, KFC, KFC, McDonald's, McDonald's, you know, five times a day. Do you have a nutritional discussion with them? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it? You know, financial planning almost has to form, you know, or, 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 or look at uh, almost the kind of um, psychology uh, mm. aspect of, of, you know, even things like, relationships and uh and yeah things like healthy eating and uh you know how do we overcome even for insurance obesity issues mm. etc so yeah there's a lot of stuff like that that you know so it's not something, yeah it's not something we've delved into but they are they are things we've thought about and and uh and how could we deliver some services around that perhaps not even internally but how could we bring in some external help totally that? Mm. yeah and that's that's the key you don't always have to do everything yourself absolutely but if you can deliver the the, the solution uh through well, the identification provider, and bring yeah, it in you want those clients coming to you with any problem even though mm-hmm. you go well geez i don't know about who's a good dietitian but i'm glad you asked me you yeah. know that's what you want to have happen mm. totally yeah well scott thank you for coming on yeah it's been no, a great always. chat yeah. sort of we've gone through a few things and really exciting what you're doing with uh with savvy and, yeah um, any advisors please reach out to scott he's, he's a great dude he'll chat to you about it and uh awesome and it sounds like it's it's doing really well so thank you very much yeah thanks adrian thanks for your support